our go, Father. Open your word in our hearts and minds this morning. And may the message that we hear today never be forgotten. But may we all band together in unity to declare this message until Jesus comes. We praise you and we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Prophetic forecast. Cloudy with a chance of, not meatballs, but of course, Sunday law. Uh, this is a message that uh, is not really heard that often. Not that necessarily we have those who are trying to purposely hide it or keep from talking about it, but it's just one of those messages that uh, we yet to look forward to see how it's going to unfold. We are indeed today going to be talking about what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, uh, even as much as some of the news outlets and uh, different organizations around us are saying about this Sunday sacredness movement. Movement. And I believe that this is a very, very powerful message that needs to be delivered today. We all need to be paying attention uh, to the prophetic message on this topic because we know and we have been told that this is indeed coming. I want to start this off with kind of a, a very interesting public statement that was made by a mayor in Ontario, Canada. He's a politician, uh, and obviously he has some influence, and he released this public statement via his Twitter account, and I'm going to quote him at this moment. These are his words. Notice what he says here. Just putting this out there for consideration. Once we kick COVID-19's butt, I'd suggest that everything be closed on Sundays again so that we can appreciate the importance of what taking a pause in our busy lives really means. I think our body, mind, and soul would thank us. Very interesting indeed. We, we see this often occur where we have public officials, articles, statements that are made often by religious leaders or uh, influential people around our world that we see in more and more of this, especially over the past few decades, of people talking about the importance of observing Sunday. And uh, I just want to state for the record, we as Seventh-day Adventists, I know me as a Seventh-day Adventist, I believe in worshiping the Lord every single day. And we want to make that very, very, very clear. Uh, the Sabbath is indeed in the Bible, the seventh day of the week. And we also want to make that clear, that while we should worship God every single day, as we're going to talk about today, we know that the biblical Seventh-day Sabbath is Saturday and not Sunday. But yet there seems to be this gradual move there seems to be this movement occurring kind of uh, behind closed doors or underneath the surface that uh, has people thinking in the direction of maybe bringing about a movement, legislation, laws that will put this into place in which everyone must observe Sunday as a day of rest, as a holy day of observance. Now, the reason why I feel that this is important to talk about is because, first of all, I feel personally convicted that all of these prophetic themes in the Bible, not just this one, but all of them, should be declared in these last days. We know that the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are going to the entire world, and God's remnant people who are full of the Holy Spirit in the last days, they will rise up and they will preach this message, including giving out the warning and the clear message that there are Sunday laws that will come, that will be passed, and we will have to make a decision otherwise. In fact, I want to read a statement right now. This is found in the Review and Herald, December 24, 1889. Notice this very powerful statement. It says, there are many who are at ease, who are, as it were, asleep. They say, if prophecy has foretold the enforcement of Sunday observance, the law will surely be enacted. And having come to this conclusion, they sit down in a calm expectation of the event, comforting themselves with the thought that God will protect his people in the day of trouble. But God will not save us if we make no effort to do the work he has committed to our charge. And then it goes on to say, as faithful watchmen, you should see the sword coming and give the warning. 
that men and women may not pursue a course through ignorance that they would avoid if they knew the truth. And so again, as I said before, while yes, we have men and women and brethren within our movement that have risen up, that are teaching this message, some are a little hesitant to declare such a message or to talk about this Sunday law because when you start talking about Sunday laws that haven't yet take place, obviously there's going to be some speculation from others around you. Perhaps maybe we have visitors who are sitting in our congregations from Sabbath to Sabbath and we just choose not to talk about this subject because we don't want to offend someone or we don't want to uh, bring about a fear or maybe make people think that we're weird by talking about such things. But nonetheless, my friends, we are counseled in the spirit of prophecy that we are to raise the banner of truth, that we are to sound the alarm, and that now while we have an opportunity during this time of peace, and I know that kind of sounds uh, contradicting or counteractive to talk about a time of peace with all of this COVID-19 and all this happening around us, but yet we know we are not living in what the Bible calls the time of trouble that will be so much far worse than what we are going through now. Again, that is not to spark fear. That is not to spark anxiety or worry into the hearts, but rather bring about an awakening of God's people that we may be awake and aware of the times that we are living in, that we may keep a watchful eye of the things that are happening around us so that when we see these things happening, as Jesus said, we will know that his coming is very near. Now, before we go any further, I just want to establish some prophetic foundation for what I'm going to be talking about today. Many of you may consider this to be review. Many of you may consider this to be something that you already know. But there may be someone watching right now that says, you know what, I'm hearing this for the very first time. And as I said in the beginning of this, of this sermon, this message is for everyone. The message of a coming Sunday law and the cloudy times that we're living in, we know that this is not just for Seventh-day Adventists. This is for the entire world as the three angels' messages go to the entire world, all nations, languages, and tongues. And so I want to begin talking about the prophetic skeleton, the very foundation of how we come to this message and where we are in declaring this Sunday law movement that will be up on us very soon. I want to start in the book of Daniel chapter 7. And it's very interesting when you start reading the opening verses of Daniel 7 because Daniel obviously is in vision and he sees some rather interesting things. He sees as he's standing on the edge of the sea and he's looking out on the bankment there, he's looking out at the sea and he sees this lion come up out of the water uh, with obviously a double or a, a set of wings. So a, a winged lion, rather interesting figure. But as this lion begins to fade away, coming up out of that same water comes a bear with three ribs in its mouth and it's raised up on one side and then of course as that bear is fading away in the distance there comes another interesting creature up out of that same water a four-headed leopard a leopard with four heads and it has not just a pair of wings but a double set of wings and then as that third animal or beast is fading in the distance we see a fourth beast come about. Daniel isn't even able to describe or actually give a proper name to this fourth beast. He just describes him as being terrible, dreadful, more powerful than any other beast before him, destroying all the others in its path, and of course, bringing about a world dominant movement that would change the world forevermore. Now, we need not go very far as to know what these beasts represent, because right there in the seventh chapter of Daniel, we're told that these beasts represent kings, which obviously have kingdoms. So these are powerful world dominant empires from Daniel's day all the way down to the very end of the world. And we know that lion to simply represent the kingdom of Babylon, because it makes very clear to us in uh, constitution with or in parallel with Daniel chapter two, we know that the head of gold was indeed the kingdom of Babylon. Also, coming after Babylon, represented by the chest and arms of silver in Daniel 2, as well as the, the uh, uh, bear with three ribs in its mouth coming up would obviously be the kingdom of Medo-Persia. 
And then, of course, we have the third kingdom that came after the Medes and the Persians, which was the kingdom of Greece, which is represented by the belly and thighs of bronze in Daniel chapter 2, as well as the four-headed beast there, in, uh, or the four-headed leopard in Daniel chapter 7. And then, interestingly enough, you come in Daniel chapter 2 to these legs of iron, which proceed into the feet. And then, of course, obviously, in Daniel chapter 7, this horrible, dreadful, terrible beast that has iron teeth. There's no doubt which nation came after the nation of Greece as a world dominant empire. We're talking about the empire of Rome, the pagan influence of Rome. But I didn't bring you here to talk about all of those individual beasts. I want to bring your attention to what comes after this fourth beast, because Daniel's attention, his attention is brought to the head of this fourth beast. It's almost as if God hits the zoom button on the camera. He zooms in on the head of this fourth beast, and he sees a little horn. Notice Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. The Bible says, I was considering the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in the horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words or great things. And so it's very interesting to consider that also in Daniel chapter 7, we're not to speculate as to what these horns represent. They also represent small divisional kingdoms within the larger empire of Rome. So this little horn would represent a small kingdom. I recognize that this is probably review for many, but nonetheless, this is vitally important as we consider and talk about this coming Sunday law movement, this legislation that we are told is going to happen. We must understand this at its roots, at its foundation. Notice what Daniel also says about this little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half of time. So very interestingly here, you see that there is a little bit more detail given about this little horn. He's speaking great words against the Most High. That would be Jesus. That would be God, right? Obviously, he's, he's, uh, he's going on to persecute the saints of God's people. Obviously, God's people, the saints, he's persecuting them. And then he goes on to say that he intends or thinks to change times and law. And we do not need to wonder as to what type of times and laws or law this is talking about because the theme of this chapter, of course, is God. He's attacking God. He's speaking against God. He's wearing out or persecuting the saints of God, and therefore it's be it begs for us to, to conclude that this law that he thinks he has the power to change is none other than God's holy law, the Ten Commandments. And there just happens to be a special commandment within those ten, not more important than any of the others, but it just so happens to deal with time. And of course that would be the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this out is because you, you can just simply do some research and you will find that most biblical scholars today agree that this little horn of Daniel chapter 7, and he's also brought up again in Daniel chapter 8, we see seen there desecrating the temple and casting truth to the ground. Most biblical scholars today and theologians agree that this little horn is no doubt the antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, they may not agree on the identity of that little horn, but there's no doubt in their mind that this little horn power is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, I made mention of that because we're going to skip over now to the book of Revelation, and you will see this same power rears its head in John's day. In other words, John is shown in vision a beast, and we know that this is an Antichrist power by looking at the descriptions given. I want to start in Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Notice what the Bible says here. He says, Then I stood up on the sand of the sea, just as Daniel did, and I saw a beast, now this is just one singular beast, rising up out of the sea, and then notice the description, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. 
Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So just kind of right in these opening verses here, we see uh, that this beast is quite different than some of the beasts that were mentioned, obviously, in Daniel chapter 7. However, it's interesting to note that this one singular beast of Revelation 13 seems to be an amalgamation of all of the beasts of, Revelation, or of Daniel chapter 7, because because we have again a lion, a bear, and a leopard mentioned there in Daniel 7, of which this one beast in Revelation 13 is comprised of. And so that being said, if you continue on, you start to, you kind of just, you're able to dial in the identity of who this is and how it's connected to Daniel 7's little horn when you go on to read in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 13. So we're going to read Revelation 13 verses 5 through 8. Notice what the Bible says. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. There it is again. And he was given authority to continue 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, very similar to the little horn, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints. So there it is, persecuting the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So my friends, this power is not some little mealy-neely little system on a corner of some street somewhere. We're talking about a world-dominant system. And again... Most biblical scholars and theologians would agree that this power is no doubt a replica, a, a, an extension of what we see in Daniel 7 in this little horn. We're talking about the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And at this point, I don't think I need to even hold back any further of just simply placing the proper identity upon who this power is because we are no doubt talking about the Roman papal church state. We're talking about the Roman Catholic church system. And you'll notice that I said system because we know that God is not at war with people. He loves all of his people. And I believe with all my heart that God has good, wonderful people in the Catholic church. So we're not talking about people necessarily. We're talking about a system that is carried out, yes, by many different individuals, but this system is counterfeit to God's kingdom agenda. We know that this is very antichrist in nature. And so we see here that this Roman papal church state system, and there's a lot that I could have said about these individual details of these passages, but I want to continue on to the meat of this particular sermon today because we want to get a dive a little deeper into what we're talking about in reference to how this beast power is going to bring about a Sunday observance movement and put it into law or influence it to be put into law. I just want to note here, at the end of verse 2 of Revelation 13, and I'm just simply referencing this, it says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. We know that the dragon is none other than the devil himself. So this Roman papal church state system is indeed created and established and empowered by the devil himself. Now when you read through Revelation chapter 13, you're going to come to a second beast. So when we identify the first beast, we're talking about the Roman papal church state system. But when you read on down onto verse 11 of Revelation chapter 13, John sees in vision a second beast, not coming up out of the sea, but coming up out of the earth. And we know that in the time frame, as the book of Revelation chapter 13 tells us, that this first beast was given a deadly wound. He eventually saw that this deadly wound would be healed. Now, when the deadly wound was given, we know that that was in and around 1798 when the Pope of Rome was taken captive and arrested by Napoleon Bonaparte's general Berthier. And we read there in history and we see that the Catholic Church, their political authority was taken away. Their great worldwide dominant influence was taken away for a moment in time. And they were simply just another church system. But when you get to verse 11 of Revelation 13, 
and you see this second beast coming up out of the earth, you start to see another world dominant power come into existence. And I'm not even going to hide this at all because we know very clearly that this is none other, according to the time frame, one coming up out of the earth, a sparsely populated area. We're talking about none other than the nation, the worldwide empire of the United States of America. And here's where it gets even more interesting. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, speaking of this second beast, the United States superpower, notice it says in verse 12, and he exercises all of the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now I have to say for the record, that deadly wound, even as I speak, is not completely healed as of yet, but it has been healing since 1929 when the Italian president Mussolini gave back to the Catholic Church system their religio-political influence and power. In other words, they became another great state, another empire to be able to rule and to give great influence among our world. And so there, verse 12 of Revelation chapter 13 tells us very clearly that the United States of America and the papacy, the first beast of Revelation 13, the great antichrist of Bible prophecy, they're going to unite in the last days. They're going to create an alliance. And we know very clearly that they're going to work together to enforce worship, a system of worship. Notice verse 16 in Revelation chapter 13. It says, he, speaking of the second beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so there it is. We know this to be the mark of the Beast, And when we, we just want to dial that in. I want to dial that in right quick. When we talk about the mark of the beast, we're talking about the mark of the first beast of Revelation 13. We're talking about the mark of the Antichrist of the Bible. We're talking about the mark of the Roman papal church state. So what we've just read in Bible prophecy is very clear that in the last days you will see, my friends, hear me clear. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a servant of the Lord declaring what the word of God says. And the word of God tells us very clearly that in the last days, the United States of America as a, as, as a nation, as an empire, will make an alliance, create a relationship with Rome in carrying out and enforcing worship upon this planet worldwide. And it's going to come via this mark. Now, the mark of the beast, there is much we can say about biblically. I didn't come to give a complete message on the mark of the beast. That's another message for another time. In fact, I would encourage you to go do some research on that. Uh, you know, reach out to some of these, to, to your local Seventh-day Adventist church or any of the great ministries within our church. You know, it is written, amazing facts, and obviously 3ABN. We, we have all kinds of resources on what the mark of the beast is. But I want to make it very, very clear, my friends. The mark of the beast stands in direct contrast to the seal of God in the Bible. And when you do a responsible research in Scripture, you will find that the seal of God in Scripture is none other than the Sabbath of the Lord. God's mark, His seal of authority, as we're told in the book of Ezekiel chapter 20. Obviously, His seal, His sign, His mark of authority is His Sabbath commandment. When we observe and we honor the biblical Sabbath as given in the Ten Commandments, then we are honoring and recognizing God as the supreme creator being that He is. And so the mark of the beast, the mark of the papacy, who's empowered by none other than the devil himself, it just makes perfect sense that the devil would say, oh, God has His mark of authority he has his sign of authority. Then in obvious terms, we can say that in contrast to that, the devil should have his mark of authority. The beast that he's empowering should have its sign, its seal of authority. And we do not have to go very far to determine or to know what the mark of the papacy really is or the mark of the beast really is because they tell us very clearly even in their own writings. I and mean, you can find tons of research on this, but I'm going to read just a couple here just for clarification purposes. Notice the the Catholic record, September 1st, 1923, they make it very clear. Sunday is our mark of authority. 
The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And so very, very clear right out of their own mouth. They're like, hey, look, we're, well, let, us, let us tell you what our mark of authority is. Don't be guessing as to what it is. We're going to tell you it's Sunday. In fact, notice the chancellor to the famous Cardinal Gibbons had this to say also. Speaking of the change of the Sabbath, he says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. And so there we are very clear. This great alliance of the United States in the last days, as the Bible prophecy tells us, and the papacy of Rome, the Roman papal church state system will align together and they will bring about a movement in which they will enforce what is known as in the Bible, the mark of the beast, which is none other than the mark of the papacy. And that mark is none other than Sunday observance. Now, again, I want to be very clear. We're not talking about Sunday worship. We're not talking about uplifting and praising God on Sunday because we should do that every day of the week. But the Bible makes it very clear that there's only one Sabbath, my friends. And God's Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. It's Saturday. It always has been. The weekly cycle has never changed. But the devil wants to counterfeit God's sign of authority. He wants to make a counterfeit of that. And he wants to pass it off as a new Sabbath day, as a new day of rest, as a new time of national or corporate worship and observance. In fact... All of this is the reason why Babylon is seen fallen in the second angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14 verse 8. And another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has made all nations, everyone on the planet, drunk by the wine. What does wine do? It, it's intoxicating. It causes a person to become inebriated, confused, which is exactly what Babel or Babel means. It means confusion. So she's confusing the world with her false intoxicating doctrines. And we see that also in Revelation chapter 17. But now we come to the bulk of what I wanted to get into today, which is how this Sunday law, this mark of the beast movement is going to come about. And I believe very, very soon, my friends. And I do want to say for the record, while I recognize that I am not a prophet and while I recognize that I, I do not have anything authoritative to say in the matter other than what the word of God and the spirit of prophecy reveals to us, we should be awake at this time. We should be looking and being aware and responding to what we are seeing around us to to blow the trumpet, to declare this message, to make every single person around us aware of what is coming about so that they might be saved in these last days before Jesus comes. I think it was a great shock to the Christian world back in 2013 when in the month of February, we saw something that in our lifetime, in fact, in, in, a, in a few centuries, have not seen ever, and that is the resignation of a pope. We saw in February of 2013, Pope Benedict resigned as the Pope. Now, this had not happened prior to this in nearly 600 years. So it's very rare for something like this to happen. But you see here in this particular article coming from the Catholic News, it says ex-Pope Benedict says God told him to resign during a mystical experience. Very interesting indeed. A mystical experience. Now, this was very interesting and brought about, about some speculation among many Christians, not even Catholic. I mean, we're looking at this and we're going, Man, what's happening here? This is very rare. This is interesting. In fact, uh, not to bring up speculation or conspiracy theory, but I thought this to be interesting. And I put this article in here from USA Today that on the very day that he resigned, uh, you see there that a lightning strikes the Vatican literally. And of course, it happened at the same day that Pope uh, Benedict resigned from office. Now, whether or not that holds any significance. I'm not the one to declare that. I certainly don't want to get into any conspiracy theory or to be authoritative on the matter, but it will be interesting that when we get to heaven to say, hey, Lord, did, was you trying to tell us something there? I'm sure he'll make it very clear whether that was supposed to be received as such or not. But that being said, that was a very, very significant event because now that's going to call about a new pope. Now, 
I don't spend my time as a Christian, you know, monitoring or watching every little single move that the papacy makes, right? I think we should always, first and foremost, have our attention on the Christ, not the Antichrist, right? We should have our attention on Jesus Christ always, because if we have our attention on Jesus Christ, he's going to steer us in the right direction, and we will be prepared to stand firm when he, when he appears and comes. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that we are told to be awake, to be watchful, to be aware of the things that are happening happening around us, that when we see these things happening, to know that the coming of Jesus is near, that the end of the world is near. And so I found it interesting that on the day that Pope Francis was elected, this was, this comes on March 13, 2013, just a few weeks after Pope Benedict resigns, they elect their new Pope. And it just so happens to be for the first time ever, a Jesuit Pope. Now, I'm not going to go deep into what the Jesuits are. That's some research that you need to do on your own. But if you look up this Society of Jesus, this, this Jesuit movement, it has a very dark history. And again, I'm not trying to say that personally that, uh, that uh, Pope Francis is a dark man. But nonetheless, he holds the office of the leader of this Antichrist system. And I think we need to hold it accountable, hold him accountable for the office that he is usurping. And that is the kingly, priestly, and authoritative office of Jesus Christ himself. Notice in this Christianity Today article from March 2013, this is actually released on the day that Pope Francis was elected. And notice what they entitled this, a Pope for all Christians. Now the picture can be a little deceptive there because you see Pope Benedict, but you'll see that the date there is February, or excuse me, March 13. This was the very day that Pope Francis was elected. And they're simply calling about and saying that there's now been a change in authority. That now we have a new Pope, a Pope for all Christians. And I find that interesting because he's not a Pope for me and I'm a Christian, right? And I would suspect that there's many of you watching today that say, well, he's not my Pope, but yet Christianity today is very much suggesting a Pope for all Christians. In fact, in the actual article that they pin down here, notice what they say within the body of this article. They use these words. It says, one consequence of globalization is that the walls that have long divided Catholics from Orthodox, mainline Protestants, Evangelicals, and Pentecostals are eroding. Relations between Catholics and Protestants are warmer than ever. So one would suspect that Christianity today is a Protestant uh, source, a Protestant entity. But nonetheless, they are recognizing here in this article that when Pope Francis took office, what a great time he did because now things are warmer than ever between Protestants and Catholics. In fact, Time Magazine, that very same year in July, would release their edition and they would call this particular edition uh, the People's Pope. Obviously, uh, Pope Francis's picture is right there on the front. So you start to see this very interesting movement begin to take place. They're just since they're just there was just a sense of change, a sense of, of, of changing of direction, agenda. That there's this new pope, new agenda. We're living in the new 21st century, new times, and now we're ready for a new leadership to take place. And it's interesting that uh, there's no way of denying what this Pope's agenda was because coming right out the front, he lets everyone know that his agenda in multiple resources and multiple public statements, that he wanted to unite all the world and all religions and even all of Christianity. In other words, all denominations. Unity, unity, unity. I could show you article after article, statement after statement where this Pope makes it clear that his agenda, his purpose, his goal is to unite the whole world under the banner of Catholicism and making just one big giant church system. No need for, you know, Protestants and Catholics that we could all be the universal church. That's what Catholic means, universal. In fact, we also don't need to uh, speculate as to what his agenda was and what he believed on this issue of Sunday keeping versus biblical Sabbath keeping, because here's an article very clearly where he made a statement and he says, keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society. So that's a statement made by Pope Francis. And there are many, many, many other statements that I could show you as well over the years where he has made that clear statement, pushing for Sunday, making it clear that Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is the Christian Sabbath, and we should observe it very clearly. But I think the greatest curveball came about in 2015, more specifically, 
June 18, 2015, when Pope Francis released his worldwide encyclical entitled Laudato Si, Laudato Si, there we go. And uh, I, I think it means praise be or blessed be, something like that. But notice what he says in section 237. And then we're going to talk about why that's important. He says in section 237 of his encyclical on June 18, 2015, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Now, Obviously, this entire encyclical, if you go do your research and read this, you can go online and find it. It's in English. It's been translated into English, and you can read every word that he had to say in that encyclical. And it's basically an encyclical pushing uh, climate control, that we need to get our earth back together. We need to get a grip on this global warming uh, crisis, and we need to work to heal our land and heal our relationships and heal our families and heal our churches back together in this global climate change effort. And in section 237, as we just read, he says, now, very interestingly, he says, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, first of all, I want to make a correction to Pope Francis in this instance, that first of all, it's not considered in the Bible the Jewish Sabbath, because in the Bible, it's just the Sabbath of the Lord. So there's no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath in the Bible. But notice how he makes that mistake. And then he says, Sunday is like it. Sunday is not like the Jewish Sabbath at all, for the record. Uh, Sunday is, according to the Bible, a day of labor, a day of work. God said, work six days, rest on the seventh day. But notice how he's pushing this agenda. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day that heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. In that statement, he's basically saying that, you know what, if... If we would get back to observing Sunday, honoring Sunday, and keeping Sunday holy, our relationships with each other would improve, our relationship with God would improve, and God would be able to keep from all of these horrible calamities happening across the globe. And that is correct. In his encyclical, he insinuates very clearly and implies that many of these calamities are brought about because in many of his, he makes multiple points as to why, but in one of them, obviously, he says it's because we're not honoring the the Sunday Sabbath, the Sunday Sabbath effort. So he's linking Sunday observance and climate change together. Now that brings me to our ultimate point in the time that we have closing here. Notice great controversy, page 590, how there's a nice response to what we've just read. Uh, she says here in Great Controversy, page 590, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance has uh, or shall be strictly enforced. So it's very interesting that that happened. And I have to say, on that very day that Pope Francis released his encyclical, there's an interesting response from Speaker, or it's not Speaker of the House, but Secretary of State John Kerry. And this is actually a snapshot of the U.S. Department of State website. Notice what he says here in these opening lines. He says, the Pope's powerful encyclical calls for a common response to the critical threat climate change poses to our common home. And then notice the section there in blue. His plea for all religions to work together reflects the urgency of the challenge. And if that wasn't good enough, on the exact same day, the same day that he released it, there was also a response from the president at that time, Barack Obama. And notice what he says in his statement released by the White House. He says, I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis's encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position for action on global climate change. And then notice this next little opening part here. He says, as Pope Francis so eloquently stated this morning, we have a profound responsibility to protect our children and our children's children from the damaging impacts of climate change. And then notice what he says here. I believe the United States must be a leader in in this effort. So there it is. There's the alliance. I believe the, the president of the United States says that we should lead out in what the Pope has said. We should be leaders in, 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 in trying to reduce climate change. Now, my friends, I want to say for the record, 
I believe that we should take care of our lands. I believe that we should be aware uh, of the climate change and, and all these things that may or may not, whether you believe it is, I know it's a very divisive issue. Some people believe there's global warming. Some people believe it's not. But whether you do or you don't, as a Christian, we should want to take care of our environment. We should want to care about the safety and well-being of all of Earth's humanity and our children and our family and our friends and everyone around us. But my friends, notice this is being used as the vehicle to push a Sunday observance uh, movement. A Sunday law movement will come about. According to this, it's looking very clear, but let's continue to look at some more evidence. In fact, in response to what uh, Barack Obama as president just said, it's very interesting. Notice the last day events, page 135. Very interesting uh, comment here. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States, though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of of the world. So again, just further solidifying that this will happen. And if you were here in 2015 and you saw this uh, manifesting itself, then you also know that the Pope came to the United States. And for the first time in our nation's history, we had a religious figure to address a joint session of Congress. And we know that that was Pope Francis. He came in, I believe it was September of 2015, just months after releasing this encyclical. In fact, he made some points in his address, uh, some pushes for his encyclical in this address. And so there's, there's no need, when you look at the evidence, there's no need to speculate or to wonder, what is this papal movement doing? What is their goal? What is their purpose? What is their agenda in these last days that will lead to the closing events of Bible prophecy? There's really no need to get around the fact that this will indeed happen. Notice Parliament. This is, this is actually an article that came from the Parliament. And this, I'm, I'm showing these now very quickly in closing here. I want to show you some, some articles and some things that, that I noticed because I've had a lot of time to do some research on this and it's very interesting to notice what is going on in our society and how society has responded to this encyclical and to the Pope's suggestions and his, his, his downright commands to the world that we need to all gather together under this effort. Notice the, this is a part an argument, a part of, uh, excuse me, an article from the Parliament. That's a, that's a big thing to say there. Sunday work, notice this, is a danger to our health and safety, which is exactly what Pope Francis has been preaching since he's been in office there as Pope. That's what he said in his encyclical, that, that, that working on Sunday, not observing Sunday as a holy day is a danger to our health and safety, especially in reference to this climate change. In fact, notice Croatian news. This is a Croatian news article. And notice what they say here. Catholic Church wants to ban working on Sunday. Notice how this message is getting into all of the surrounding nations. That's exactly what Revelation 13 says would happen. That this, this, this powerful antichrist beast power would work closely with all of the nations of the world and it would basically deceive the nations of the world. Notice this interesting article from the Pacific Standard Magazine. Notice the, this is actually from 2017. And notice what they had to say here. Pacific Standard Magazine, the title of this article was Growing Concern Over, there it is, Climate Change is Creating Interfaith Dialogue. And when you go down and look in the body of this particular article, notice what it says here under this statement called Interfaith Appeal. They make this very clear here. The Pope doesn't expect this movement to just be a Catholic thing, said longtime Vatican observer Mark Mickens. And then it gives his credentials there. But then notice this third line here. It says, what is extraordinary about the encyclical is that it is a project that the whole human race can engage in together. What unites, or they're asking the question, what unites all humanity? The answer, the environment. It's our common home, our common interest. So we see many different resources on this are claiming that, hey, we need to change. They're, they're need, we all need to join together and work on our climate. We need to improve this climate. And what better way to do it? We need to, we need to create a religious response to this in order to bring about change. In fact, notice this comes from CEO World Magazine, January 2018. And I found these words to be quite interesting. I'm not going to read this entire article, but I want to draw your attention to about uh, two-thirds in to this particular, where, uh, where you see the ellipses. It says, this frantic race to go faster and faster makes us forget essential things such as loving ourselves, others, and also our earth. The result is a global disaster whose 
ecological impact is more and more obvious. And then notice the closing response here. It says a Sabbath for ourselves, our industry and our environment is a correct. It is a corrective to these failures. Again, a secular magazine and a person offering the advice and saying, hey, you know what? We need a, we need a global Sabbath. We need, we need a, a worldwide Sabbath that will correct these problems that we have with our climate. And I found this to be very interesting. Uh, an article coming from the Tablet magazine, which is a Jewish magazine, by the way. And they reference Shabbat or Sabbath keeping in this article. But notice what the title of the article is here. The Sabbath in an era of climate change change. And if you look there clearly, notice the, uh, notice the, uh, uh, the, the date on that article. It is 2020. This was just probably a few weeks ago. The Sabbath in an era of climate change. And they actually say in this article that just whether it's Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, we need to have a Sabbath of rest uh, in these last days to combat this climate problem, which is exactly what the Pope has been saying, my friends. Now, I brought all of this to your attention because We've been living in a pandemic. We've been living in a crisis known as COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And we've been talking a lot about this lately. And the Lord has opened my eyes to something very interestingly. And again, I'm not making a prophetic statement here of any kind as to say that this will definitely happen. But we can certainly see the results of this, my friends, that something is coming. Now, when I started doing some interesting research here lately, I found that there are dozens and dozens of major news outlets that are, have been recording and have been putting out in their articles that pollution, get this, pollution has went down since this COVID-19 problem, which makes sense. Everyone's been quarantined, right? But they've been reporting on this. Notice these articles. I'm going to go through them rather quickly. Air pollution. This is Fox News Detroit. Air pollution drops across the globe amid COVID-19 pandemic, data suggests. Look at this next one coming from New York Times. It says traffic and pollution plummet as U.S. cities shut down for coronavirus. And this next one is a BBC article. And notice what its title is. Will COVID-19 have a lasting impact on the environment? My friends, I don't think that we're seeing this just by happenstance or coincidence. I think there's something here for us to at least take note of. Notice this next article in Green Biz. This is an article in Green Biz, an environmental uh, agency. The article titled here is The Stunning Impact of COVID-19 Social Distancing on Air Pollution. And then, of course, this next one is Science Alert. This is an article they produce, and notice the headline, New Evidence Shows How COVID-19 Has Affected Global Air Pollution. I can go through all of this. Global air pollution, global air pollution. And here's another one. This comes from, uh, this is National Geographic. Carbon emissions are falling sharply due to coronavirus. Okay, so very, very clear. And they say, but not for long. We'll see if that's the case. And then CNBC, notice this. Air pollution falls as coronavirus slows travel, but scientists warn of longer term threat to climate change progress. But notice this connection that they're making. And of course, the last one I have here comes from physics.org. And in their article, they make it clear air pollution declines in Spain after implementing of measure to fight COVID-19. And so what we're seeing here, my friends, is the stage is being set right now. Would it surprise us that the Pope would come forward soon and say, oh, we have proof. We have global evidence that if we just rest the land, if we take a time of rest, perhaps one day in seven, and we take a special time to rest with our family and with God and just rest the land, that it would drop and it would lower gas emissions in the, in, in, in the atmosphere and therefore improve this global climate change. My friends, we're seeing this very, very clearly. And it's interesting here in closing, I want to share this with you. In Pope Francis' encyclical, notice what he says here in section 206. He says that we should, in referencing the, the, the pressure that we should put on our politicians and how to bring this movement about, he says we should bring healthy pressure to those, to bear on those who wield political, economic, and social power. That's politics. So he's, he's, he's re recommending political uh, coercion to bring about this movement. And what's interesting is the response that I found from the Great Controversy, page 592, because notice what she says here. She says, even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. 
So my friends, there was a whole lot more that I wanted to share on this subject, but I want to be very clear in my closing moments that we have together. There are Sunday laws coming. We are seeing in right now this very interesting time that we're living in that the Pope, the papacy under the leadership of Pope Francis has been working very hard to make sure that there is a movement brought about using the vehicle or the avenue of climate change to bring about a Sunday law movement. We need to be aware. We need to be awake at this time. In fact, I just want to read this review and Herald page, excuse me, review and Herald, February 16, 1905. Here it is in plain, but very clear, simple words. She says, sooner or later, Sunday laws will be passed. There it is. Very clear, very plain and simple. So I want to urge you today, my friends, we need to be on our knees praying. We need to be praying and we need to be asking the Lord to fill our hearts and minds to change us soon. And you know what? We as Seventh-day Adventists and anyone who believes in this message need to be standing firm on this message and declaring it now, warning everyone of what is coming so that they can stand firm and at the, in confidence at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for joining us today. And as we go off the air here, I would like to say a prayer. Father, we simply ask you to fill us in these last days. Change us, O oh Lord. Equip us for what is to come. And we simply plead for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.